peace is a gift from the Almighty God. I want you to notice the words true peace because that implies that there is in the world what we might refer to as a false peace. Throughout the entirety of history, a false peace has been declared by the enemy. In the days of Jeremiah, there were prophets who were declaring a false peace. We read about it in Jeremiah 6.14, and that statement is repeated again in Jeremiah 8, verse 11. Notice what the text says. They have also healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Notice that the false prophets were declaring that there was peace. In fact, they, loud, they loudly declared that fact, peace, peace. And yet God said, there is no peace. They were somewhat effective in their message, weren't they? Because the Bible says that these false prophets, by declaring peace, had healed slightly the hurt of the daughter of my people. There were individuals who wanted a message of peace. There were individuals who desired that message so badly that when these false prophets declared it, they immediately accepted it. Oh yes, there is peace. Yet God continued to say, there is no peace. My friends, a false peace is exactly that. It's false. It is not real it is a peace that is fake. It is a peace that is fiction. It is a peace that is make-believe. It is a peace that is unreal. Over the course of 2020, I have been engaged in a few lessons about our lesson very simply is this, false peace. Now here's the question that we're going to be looking at. It's this, how is it? that so many individuals can believe in a false peace rather than the true peace of the Almighty God? Let's look at some answers to that question. First, individuals oftentimes believe in a false peace through self-deception. I find it interesting that the Bible tells us very plainly that any of us can deceive ourselves. 1 John 1.8, notice what John writes. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Isn't that interesting? Individuals can walk around thinking that I have no sin. And yet the Bible says they deceive themselves. You see, it's possible for a human being to deceive himself. I want us to look at two ways that members of the church can deceive themselves into accepting a false peace. First, there can be members in congregations who believe that they are at peace with God when in reality they are not. Romans 12 verse 11 tells us this, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. My friends, when our Lord died for us upon the cross of Calvary, it was not just to procure our salvation, but He was also desirous that every one of us would give our lives fully, completely to His cause. Now when we say that, what we mean by that is being actively engaged in His service. He doesn't want us to be slothful individuals, lazy individuals. He wants us to be fervent in spirit. He wants us to be active and alive and fully engaged in the work of the church. Now there are many members that we could go to and we would ask them, Are you at peace with God? And you know what they would say? Oh yes. I'm at peace with God. If we were to ask them why, they would say something like this. Well, I have been baptized into Christ, and yet their lives do not manifest fervent, diligent service in the Lord's cause. You see, 
they don't always attend the worship services. These individuals are not responsible members in the body of Christ. Oh yes, sometimes they fulfill their obligations and yet there are other times in their spiritual lives when they cannot be found to save you. These are individuals who have not grown as the Lord exhorts us to grow in the body of Christ. My friends, I am not supposed to be today where I was yesterday. And certainly I'm not supposed to be today where I was 5, 10, 15 years ago. I should have grown in the cause of Christ. And yet there are many in the church who are still mere babes, even though they've been in the body for years and years and years. And Folks, those individuals' lives are not fruitful. They have not grown in the fruit of the Spirit, nor have they concerned themselves with trying to grow fruit as far as conversions of lost souls is concerned. And yet in their minds, they think everything is well. In their minds, they believe that they are at peace with God, and yet their lives don't manifest that fervency that God wants us to have. James addressed the issue in James 1 verse 22 when he said, Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, listen to what he says, deceiving your own selves. See, it's possible for me as a Christian to deceive myself into thinking that I am at peace with God when in reality my life does not manifest fervency and diligence in the service of God. My friends, that is a false peace. A second illustration. There are elderships within the church that can deceive themselves into thinking that everything is fine, that there is a peace in the local congregation. But yet the Bible tells us that if there are members that are in sin, if there are members who are unfaithful, those individuals are separated from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us that our sins and our iniquities have separated between us and our God. All members who are in sin, all members who are unfaithful are separated from God. Folks, they are not at peace for certain. And yet, there are some elderships who refuse to deal with those kind of individuals. I find it interesting that they make no efforts to restore them, yet the Bible tells us to do exactly that. Those individuals who are in sin and iniquity and separated from God, they are not rebuked because of their ungodly living. And there are many congregations who refuse to discipline those kind of individuals. You see, these elders believe in their minds everything's okay, everything's fine, everything's wonderful, there's no problems, we're all at peace, we don't have anything that we need to do. Two questions. Are those members who are in sin and unfaithful really okay? Absolutely not, folks. They are not okay. Their souls are in jeopardy, are they not? And elders of the church have a responsibility to those individuals to do all they possibly can to bring those individuals back. But my second question is this. Are the elders really okay? Oh, they love the position. They love the title. They love to be called shepherds and pastors and bishops and elders of the church. And they don't mind telling individuals about that. And yet... Here are the shepherds who refuse to take care of the sheep. Are they really okay? They think they're at peace. They think everything is fine. But they are self-deceived, aren't they, in that thinking. So you see, it's possible for us to deceive ourselves into thinking that we're at peace with God when we're not. False peace. Secondly, there's an idea, a concept that is out there that is referred to as unity in diversity. Let's first talk about the definition of unity in diversity. Here's some definitions. Agreeing to disagree. In other words, we don't see eye to eye about various issues. 
We don't see eye to eye about various passages of Scripture, about various doctrines, and that's okay. Let's just what? Let's just agree to disagree. Another. Let's go along to get along. We don't want any problems. We don't want to stir up a sting. We don't want any arguments. We don't want any strife. We don't want any division. So let's just what? Let's just go along to get along. Here's the kicker. Core issues are of importance, but other differences, they're just out there on the peripheral side of things and they really don't make that big of a difference. Now what's interesting to me about that is this. Do you want to know what the core issues are? There's really only one core issue. And it's this, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Beyond that, many individuals think nothing else really matters. Nothing else is really important. Nothing else is vital. And we certainly don't, do not need to disagree and fight and argue and divide over anything other than that one core issue. See, that's unity and diversity. How about this one? Fellowship is more important than doctrine. In fact... Fellowship for these individuals has nothing to do with doctrine. In other words, doctrine's not important. Doctrine is something that we deal with later, but right now, let's just have fellowship and love one for another. You see, let's love one another rather than seeking to speak the same thing. Unity in diversity. Here's what's interesting. Unity and diversity is a misnomer, isn't it? Unity and diversity. Folks, unity involves what? Likeness of mind, likeness of words, likeness of practice, doesn't it? That's what true unity is. And yet, diversity says what? Well, just that. A difference of opinion. A variety of practices. Many different kinds of teachings and doctrines. And yet we try to bring all of those together, one with another, and have unity. Folks, it's just not possible. How about this? Unity and diversity is really bringing together differences, opinions, all to what? Agree to disagree. All to just go along to get along. You believe what you want to believe, I'll believe what I want to believe, and let's just hug one another as if everything is wonderful. Folks, it's right there that we find a false peace, don't we? There's not agreement. There's not likeness. There's not unity. What we really have is nothing more than this. Union of individuals. One man said, you can tie two cat's tails together, throw them over a clothesline, and you've got union, but you sure don't have unity, do you? And folks, that is exactly what we're talking about out here in the religious world. We tie two cat's tails together. In fact, what we really do is tie a dog's tail and a cat's tail together, throw them over a clothesline and say, now, y'all get along. And we call that unity in our world today. It's unbelievable, folks. Unity and diversity is a concept that the denominational world has accepted for a long, long time. You see, they embrace diversity of doctrines and practices among the denominations, don't they? However, every one of them claim to belong to the same church and they all say they are all going where? To heaven. Kind of that statement that says, we're all going to heaven, but we're on different roads. Just choosing different paths to get there. Folks, that's unity in diversity. The practice is really relativism, isn't it? Relativism believes that there are many different truths that can exist in harmony one with another. The way it's stated in denominationalism is like this. You have your interpretation of the Bible, and I have my interpretation of the Bible. And even though they conflict with one another, let's just agree to disagree. Let's just go along to get along. 
Folks, it is a false peace that they are advocating. The Bible tells us many things about unity and union and oneness. There are three passages of Scripture that I always love to go to when we talk about unity because they tell us so much about what unity is. The first passage is 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, John 17, 20 and 21. This is the prayer of Jesus. And in that prayer, Jesus prays for what? Oneness of His followers. Listen to what He says. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on Me through their word, that they may be one. Notice that. Jesus prayed for oneness of His followers. Oneness of those who believe in Him. Now notice what He says. That they may be one as Thou, Father, art in Me and I in Thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that Thou hast sent Me. Folks, Jesus set up a standard for oneness in that passage, didn't He? I want my followers to be one just the way me and my Father are one. You tell me how much division there is between the Father and the Son when it comes to their beliefs, when it comes to their words, and when it comes to their practices. Folks, there is not one ounce, not one smidgen, not one iota of difference in those three beings in the Godhead. And Jesus says, the very kind of unity that exists within the Godhead is what I want in my followers. Folks, that is a high standard for unity. And it is not unity in diversity. A second passage is the one where Paul writes to the church at Corinth, the divided church. And Paul very plainly tells them that I don't want you to be divided. I want you to speak the same thing and I don't want any divisions among you whatsoever. Notice what he says. Now I beseech you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Wow. Five times. Paul exhorts them to be unified in one verse. Same thing, no divisions, perfectly joined together. Same mind, same judgment. Folks, where is there any diversity in what Paul says in that text? There isn't any. You see... Unity is not a bringing together of all of these diverse ideas, concepts, doctrines, practices, and ideologies and just saying, let's get along. No, it is everybody coming together, having the same mind, saying the same thing, and being perfectly joined together. You see, to the denominational world, doctrine doesn't matter. But my friends, when Paul discussed unity in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6... Doctrine mattered to Paul. Listen to what he says. There is one body. You see, that's part of our foundation of unity of doctrine. There's just what? One church. If you don't believe that, then we can never have what? We can never have unity one with another. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. If we don't agree on those seven ones, guess what? There can never, ever, ever be unity among believers. So what have we found? Three things. Oneness like who? Oneness like the Godhead. No divisions whatsoever. And unity upon all. All points of doctrine in the body of Christ. That's the way you obtain unity. It is not done through unity and diversity. That is a false peace. How about this one? Hardened hearts. Did you know that we can harden our hearts to such an extent that we believe that peace exists when in actuality it doesn't? 
In our conversation, there are two hearts that are really important. One is a good heart, an honest heart. Folks, that's the kind of heart every one of us should possess. A heart that is open. A heart that is willing to consider. A heart that is rational. A heart that can be discussed with. But then there is a hard heart. And folks, a hard heart will make you believe there is peace when there isn't. You see, the hard heart cannot see things as they are. A hard heart is an individual who refuses to look at the facts and rejects any evidence that is given to it whatsoever. A hard heart is one that rationalizes and justifies everything even though things are not good. And that old hard heart likes to blame others for the situations that exist. It's not our fault. Things are this way. It's just the way they are. Or someone else has brought this upon us and it's not really us who are responsible. Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? You see, the hard heart will never admit that a false peace exists. Notice this. It will deny the evidence. You see, there can be tons of disagreements among brethren And an old hard heart will just overlook it and act like it's not there. A hard heart will refuse to accept the fact that false false doctrine is being preached within a congregation. Oh well, that's just Brother Joe and you know how he is. Joe, I'm sorry about that. I saw him sitting back there when I said it. I said, oh, I should have said Larry. (laughs) But I'm glad I didn't because Larry's bigger. (laughs) You see, a hardened heart will just sweep sin under the rug. Well, yes, they're in sin, but you know, it's not that bad. Don't worry about it. This is the way he's always been. And folks, a hard heart will not admit that there are personal differences among brethren. And those brethren are fighting and warring and arguing, quarreling one with another. You see, the hard heart, rather than acknowledging that a false peace is here and that we need to deal with the issues, would rather persecute the one who points those kind of things out. The one who brings them up and says, look, we don't have peace here. We're at war. We're in strife. We're in turmoil. We're in agitation. We need to deal with this. Guess what? They will take care of that by throwing out the individual who points it out. The writer of Hebrews tells us this, Whilst it is today, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Wow. Folks, the Bible warns us, doesn't it, about manifesting this hard heart that refuses to look at facts and evidence and reality as it presents itself. And an old hard heart will cause congregations of the Lord's people oftentimes to exist in a state of false peace. One other, false doctrine. You see, false doctrine will make individuals believe that everything is wonderful and yet everything isn't wonderful. It was the prophets in the day of Jeremiah who were going around telling everyone, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah was telling the individuals, you've rejected God, you're worshiping idols, and God is going to bring down the nation of Babylon upon your head, and He is going to drive you into captivity for 70 years. The false prophets laughed. One by the name of Hananiah even said, Oh no, there's only going to be two years of captivity. You see, peace, peace, when there was no peace. False doctrine, false teaching. And individuals accept that stuff. Guys, there's a ton of false doctrine in our world today. And it causes individuals to believe they have peace with God when they do not. Let's look at two examples And the reason I choose these is because they are so prevalent within our society, especially among religious individuals. One of them is faith only. 
If you were to go out in the world and knock the doors of many individuals, you would ask them, do you have peace with God? And they would say, oh yes, I'm at peace with God. And you would ask them, how did you obtain that peace? And they would reply something like this, well, I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or I accepted the Lord Jesus into my heart. Or I prayed the sinner's prayer and... Now I've been saved. Folks, all of those statements are just a variety of different ways of saying, I have been saved by faith alone. And they might even quote a passage or two to you, might they? Romans 5.1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See there, preacher? I believe, I have faith, and therefore I have peace with God. My friends, they are living in a false peace, aren't they? Some might say, why do you say that? Well, because the Bible teaches us that we are not saved by faith only. You see then how that my works man is justified and not by faith only, James 2 verse 24. And those individuals who make that admission that I've been saved by faith alone or that I've been saved by accepting Jesus into my heart, most of them have never been baptized. And if they were, it was not for the forgiveness of sins. It was not in order to be saved. And yet the Bible teaches us plainly that in order to be saved, we must be baptized. Peter on the day of Pentecost made it clear to those Jews, didn't he? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, verse 38. So you see, faith only gives individuals this concept that they are at peace with God, and yet it is a false peace. Now this next one's really interesting as well. Another doctrine of Calvinism. Once saved, always saved. It's also referred to as the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. It is the fifth pillar of Calvinism. And basically what it says is this. If a person has been called of God to be saved... Now folks, that's an interesting term they use. Because what they believe is this. Even before they were born, even before they were thought of, even before the foundation of the world, God marked them as a saved person. You see, He called them to be saved. Now that they are here on earth, at some point in their lives, the Holy Spirit will operate on their heart, open their heart to the hearing of the gospel, and they will ultimately be redeemed by the grace of God. Why? Because God had already foreordained that. They had been predestined unto life. And now, once they're saved, guess what? There is nothing that can change that. Notice this next statement. There is nothing the person can do. Nothing the person can do to put his soul in any jeopardy whatsoever. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'm saved. I know I'm saved. And I can never be lost. Live however you want to live. And you can still never be lost. There's two ways that this teaching involves a false peace. Number one, this individual might not really be saved at all. Did you know that? Now think about that. Here's a person who has accepted Jesus into his heart. He believes that he's saved, but he might not have ever been saved, regardless of what he's believed. You see, this is the very thing these individuals argue when a so-called Christian commits a sin, isn't it? Here's one of their members. He looks like he's saved. And all of a sudden, he involves himself maybe in drunkenness. Maybe he just leaves the church completely. 
Maybe he shacks up with a, another woman, commits adultery, and leaves his wife and children. You know the argument, don't you? He was never a Christian to begin with. Wow. That's a false piece, isn't it? Think about that. He thought he was saved maybe for years. He accepted Jesus when he was eight years old. He was faithful in that church through his teenage years, in his early 20s, when he first got married, when he had children. He may have become a prominent leader or teacher in that congregation, and then at the age of 45 or 50, all of a sudden, what happens? He leaves the faith, and what do they say? Ah, he was never a Christian to begin with. That's kind of a scary thought to me. And isn't it interesting that in that church he was used as a faithful Christian? Isn't it? He grew up there. He became a teacher, maybe a deacon. He's a prominent leader in the congregation, headed up various kinds of works in that church. And then he apostatizes and guess what? All they can say is, he was never a Christian. So you are using somebody who was never a Christian in the work of the church. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Because you see, they believe he was always lost. That's the only argument that they can give. Because they don't want to believe that one can what? That one can fall from grace. Sad, isn't it? That's false peace, folks. False peace. But what about this? This individual thinks he can't lose his salvation, doesn't he? But he can. I become a Christian, I become a child of God, and I cannot lose my salvation. What a wonderful thought. But the reality is I can, can I? And folks, there are passages after passages after passages in the Scripture that teach we can. I don't know of a Christian who is an example and who is more faithful than the Apostle Paul. Do you? I don't know of a man who ever lived on earth who manifested Christ in his life more than Paul after his conversion. And Paul says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9.27 Paul knew he could lose his salvation, folks. Didn't he? Or would the Calvinists just say, if Paul had fallen away, well, he was just never a Christian. Really? He was a Christian, he was a preacher, he was a teacher, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And Paul knew, I can fall away. And that's why he kept under his body and brought it into subjection. The writer of Hebrews makes an interesting statement. For it is impossible for those, now listen to what he's talking about, for those who were once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. I don't know about you, that sounds like a Christian to me, doesn't you? Define a Christian in a different way than that. Here's a person who's been enlightened, folks. He's tasted the heavenly gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. He was made a partaker of the Holy Ghost. He tasted the good Word of God. He knew about what was to come in the world to come. But listen to what he says. For it is impossible for those that we just described, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. Wow. Paul says, these people can fall away. They can be children of God. They can have all these things that describe them and they can fall away even to the point that you can never get them back. See, here's the Bible teaching us that people can fall away and false doctrine telling people they can't. Peter's instructions are interesting too, aren't they? For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, 
through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein. Now notice that. He says they have what? They have escaped the pollutions of the world. There's only one way to do that, and that's through the blood of Jesus. It's the only way to escape the pollutions of the world. They've done that. But what happens? They get entangled again in the ways of the world. They are entangled again therein. And the latter end is what? Worse, this, worse with them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to know it and turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog has turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Wow. Peter says a person can escape the pollution of the world, go back into the world after that, and that condition is worse than had he never known the way of righteousness. My friends, a person can fall from the grace of God. And our Calvinistic friends out there need to learn that. And they need to be teaching that to their members, don't they? We need to be teaching it to them because they certainly are not. They believe that once they're saved, they're always saved. They're living under a false sense of peace from God, aren't they? There are many people who desire peace at any price. There's a lot of people out there who love peace at any price. And there's a lot of people out there who practice peace at any price. My friends, peace at any price is a false peace. Amos was right when he made this statement. Can two walk together except they be agreed? You see, that's how true peace is found. It's through a meeting of the minds on the truth of the word of the living God. Amos 3 verse 3. Folks, here's my hope for us as members of the church. That we never get caught up in a false peace. You see, the only true blessing from God is the true peace which, which springs from Him through the pages of His divine will. The Bible tells us what we need to do to have peace with God, doesn't it? Yes, faith is essential, Romans 5 verse 1, but it's not the only step in the plan of salvation. An individual after believing, must repent of sins, confess the beautiful name of Jesus, and be immersed for the remission of sins. Acts twenty two sixteen. And we as Christians, in order to stay at peace with God, must live faithfully and diligently and fervently unto the very end. If not, my friends, we can lose our salvation and no longer be at peace with God. As you examine your life, as you think about your life, do you truly have peace with God today? Maybe you need to make that peace. Do you need to respond to the invitation? Won't you come as we stand and sing?